So thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm really honored to be invited to do a lifelong learning talk. And I'm grateful that you're all here. I know there's a lot of different things um, going on right now and grateful to the students. They're in week nine. So any students that are here, just incredible that you took the time out of your busy schedule to come here as well as community partners. So thanks for showing up. Um, I'm gonna start with kind of a downer start with some not so fun facts. Um, the water and sanitation crisis, the lack of water and sanitation around the world claims more lives through disease than any war claims through guns. Diarrhea, which is linked to water and sanitation, kills more children than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined, even though these get a lot more attention than water and sanitation often. And then a lack of access to clean water and sanitation kills children at a rate equivalent to a jumbo jet full of children crashing every four hours. So as I said, kind of a downer start. And not only does this water and sanitation challenge affect health, but we're also looking at dignity issues. Um, you can think about women. If there's not a toilet to go to, you're dealing with menstrual hygiene management without a facility. Um, if you are a farmer and you have things to do on your field, if you're sick with diarrhea or other waterborne illnesses, you have limited productivity. Um, so it's a lot more than just health impacts. Just by show of hands, can you raise your hand if you're familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah. Okay, that gives me a lot of hope about the state of the world. So thank you. Um, for those of you that aren't, the United Nations has Sustainable Development Goals. These started in 2015, and they are kind of a follow-on to the Millennium Development Goals, which went from 2000 to 2015. The Millennium Development Goals really focused on low-income countries. The Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are worldwide, every country, high income, low income, and it's agreed upon by 197 countries, which is absolutely incredible that we can agree on anything at that level. Um, one piece of that is that the idea behind the SDGs is that countries take these 17 goals and they adapt them slightly to their own context. Um, and one of the aims is that we're really supporting governments in that process. So water and sanitation falls into the SDGs under ending poverty, which is goal one. There's a little bit about water and sanitation there as part of the goal to end poverty. In goal four, um, water and sanitation show up as a basic service that should be available in schools. Um, everywhere. And then there's a specific target. I have a laser pointer. There we go. There's a specific target on clean water and sanitation under goal six. And this target is that 100% of the population has safely managed drinking water and sanitation by 2030. And what I mean by safely managed, um, this is kind of pulling into the um, UN human rights to water and sanitation that started in 2015. Safely managed is defined by not only is there a water source, but it's on premises, it's available when needed, and it's free of fecal and priority chemical contaminants. And at the global level, we track arsenic and fluoride as kind of the priority chemicals, but it depends on the country. And then for sanitation, safely managed is that there's a facility that protects the user from feces. So it's a flush toilet or there's some kind of platform and then the feces are stored safely and or treated. So this is a very ambitious goal that 100% of the population would have these things. But that being said, with the UN declaring it as a human right, that means that it's every single person on this planet's right to have safe water and sanitation. So, I see three challenges. Yeah. Can you turn on the light right behind you? Yeah. Of course. Right on the wall. Like this guy. Yeah. How's that? That's great. Or this one? Ooh. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you. So, there's three challenges that I see to meeting the SDGs for water and sanitation. The first is we're starting at really low access. The second is we are progressing way too slow. And the third is that we have unsustainable solutions currently. 
So for the first challenge, low access, how many people in the world do you think don't have access to safe water? Just shout it out. Half? Half? Two-thirds? Eighty percent? Two billion? Wow, did you read the JMP report? <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> so 2.1 billion people do not have access to safely managed water. So this is water that's safe to drink, it's available, etc. In addition to that, 844 million people don't even have basic service. And basic service just means that there is a water system um, that is protected somehow, so either it's a piped system or a protected well or a protected spring, and it's within 30 minutes round trip. So going there, collecting water, coming back, 844 million people don't even have that. How about sanitation? How many people in the world? Even worse? What do you think? You're so good last time. 4.4 billion. <clears throat> so less than half of the world has access to safely managed sanitation. And then 2.3 billion don't even have basic service. And basic service is there's a flush toilet or there's a latrine with a platform that protects the user from feces but there might be a pipe that's going five feet away from that latrine and dumping feces and waste into some irrigation ditch by the home, in which case um, you're still gonna have a lot of those health issues. So the second challenge um, is insufficient progress. And this is based on the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program data that came out just this year, and these are the SDG baselines. So this report talks about our starting point. But the Joint Monitoring Program has been collecting data since 2000, um, actually 1990, but officially since 2000 with the MDGs. And they graphed the annual rate of change that countries have been improving access to just basic drinking water. And then whatever their current proportion of the population has basic drinking water. So if we look at these against each other, we see that of the countries where they haven't reached 95% coverage already, we've taken those out. So the US is out of this, um, France is out of this, but for the countries that aren't at 95% coverage, 15 of them are on track to reach 100% of the population by 2030. Whereas 68 countries are just progressing too slow, you see a lot of countries around 1% growth per year. And if you're starting at 40, 50 percent coverage, you're not going to reach 100 percent by 2030, just basic math. And then really interesting, you have 10 countries where coverage is actually decreasing. And same goes for sanitation, similar issues. 14 countries look like they'll make it. And again, this is just basic service, not safely managed. Um, and then there's 89 countries that are just progressing too slow and 20 countries that coverage is actually decreasing over time. So why is it decreasing? A lot of different reasons. Population growth, um, you might have um, instability. But another reason is that we have unsustainable services. So here when I talk about sustainability, you know, we talk about sustainability in a lot of contexts. For the water and sanitation sector, we typically are referring to continued delivery of water and sanitation services and that they're actually used. And this is a very dynamic concept. So it's not just referring to a water system or a toilet, but the actual provision of water and sanitation service. So if the toilet breaks down, but they still have access to sanitation service, that's what we're looking at for sustainability. And so the idea is that you know, we can construct infrastructure, but ensuring permanent service, forever permanent, is a whole nother story. So unfortunately, we tend to see the infrastructure side of things. Nonprofit organizations, including work that I've done, you know, we take our pictures and kids everywhere are adorable. Um, so these are success stories and it's all great. And then we go back six months to a year, maybe two years later, if we go back. And that's sometimes what we see. Hand pump breaks down, pit latrine gets clogged foundation falls in, the pit collapses. These are broken pipes from a rainwater catchment system in Rwanda. 
Um, and what ends up happening is, you know, we get back to that dignity issue and the health issue. People that were relying on these systems are now having to go back to the dirty water sources that they went to before. Or if it's a sanitation project that failed, now people are going back to open defecation practices, which out of respect for dignity, I have not included a photo of. So this is a very common challenge. Um, if we look at failure rates from 1997 to 2013, um, almost 40% of water supply projects fail around the world. So we go in with the best of intentions and we build projects and 40% of them fail. It's really disheartening. We don't really have global data on sanitation, but from anecdotal evidence, it's probably much higher. Um, the failure rate for sanitation is likely higher. Yeah. Great question. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for leading us into it. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's not. So I'll do some case studies and then maybe we can talk more about that in Q&A. Because I think that's kind of the million dollar question in the sector. Maybe billion dollar if you ask USAID. So um, the main thing here is just kind of this idea that we're already progressing very slow. And if we keep having projects fail, we're never going to actually progress forward to the rate that we need. So why we're all here tonight is technology the answer to these challenges. So when I was working in aerospace, as Chuck mentioned, I was working at Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado. Loved my job. Um, but I had finished undergrad in engineering, so I actually had this thing called free time for the first time in four and a half years. I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, so I joined Engineers Without Borders at the University of Colorado, and you could join as a professional member. I went and I heard this great talk about water and sanitation in Rwanda. And I was like, man, I love aerospace, but this is a whole nother level. I'm totally intrigued, I'm into it. So I quit my job, went back to school, and I pictured designing all these really like cool, innovative technologies that are just gonna save the world and solve water and sanitation problems. Um, if you're here tonight to hear about those cool technologies, it's gonna be a disappointing talk because I'm gonna try and convince you that the answer to this question from my experiences is no. That technology will not solve the world's water and sanitation problems. But I'll give you some case studies and you should decide for yourself. So case study one, um, I started working with EWB, CU, Engineers South Borders, um, with their Rwanda project in 2005. And I traveled to Rwanda in 2007, 2008, and 2009. So one of the places we were working is Marumba. Here's Kigali, or Chigali, the capital of Rwanda. And here's Marumba. And it's a rural area, but if you've been to Rwanda, it's incredibly populated, even in the rural areas. So you get crowds like this real fast. So we were working in this town, and there's a community tap that's down the road from this building. And then there's a spring down the hill. And they're both contaminated with E. coli. So as an example, this water test on the left, that's 3M petrofilm, just a type of test. And every blue dot represents one colony forming unit of E. coli, which represents fecal contamination. Basically, your neighbor's shit if you're in this community. So not something you want to be drinking. And this water sample is one milliliter. And to give you a reference, the World Health Organization and Rwanda National Standards are less than one colony forming unit of E. coli in 100 milliliters. And here we're looking at, I don't know, how many blue dots does that look like? Maybe 10, 12 in one milliliter. So 1,200 instead of less than one. So the project, the idea was to provide treated water, to actually take this water and treat it so that the health clinic, which is this building here, um, they have clean water, especially since they have a maternity ward. Um, so clean water is really important. And then clean water for the community. So they came up with this bring your own water or BYOW system, cleverly called. And this was designed by engineers with um, Engineers South Borders at CU and Johnson Space Center. But really the three guys that were the brilliant engineers behind this are Evan Thomas, Max Gold, and then Jean-Pierre Habana-Kabizi. 
And they came up with this really well-engineered system. And the idea is that you bring a bucket of water or a jerry can of water from the water source. You dump it in this inlet here. It goes down through a pipe. It flows up through a gravel roughing filter. So that's just gravel in a big bucket or a barrel. A small portion of that water goes into this holding tank over here, which is later used to backwash this sand filter. And the rest of the bucket goes down, is dispersed evenly across the sand filter, comes up this pipe, and then is disinfected by a solar panel powered ultraviolet water disinfection system, and then comes out the other end. Pretty cool. I was like in awe of these guys. And they wrote an article and they said, this has the potential to be replicated around the world where communities have similar water treatment requirements. So it seems like a big problem solver, right? This is like gonna change the world. So the technology is awesome. They published an article, they got a patent and I wasn't on the trip this year and I went the next year and I was so excited to see this system in person. So Max Gold and I went to the clinic and that's how it looked the entire time that we were in this community, which was six weeks. Not a single person used it. And you saw in that other slide just how many people are in this community. I mean, it's, you get crowds very quickly. No one is using this system. So the problem wasn't solved. And Max and I talked about, you know, should we use these materials? There's a UV system in here that's worth a lot of money. Should we take this to another community? Should we use the pipe and the barrels and put it to use somewhere? And JP, Jean-Pierre Habanakabizi, he's Rwandan, he's like, no, 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 you can't take it. You gave it to the community. It's a monument. So now it sits there, ooh, sorry. It sits there, and according to JP, it's the monument that we left, um, which is disheartening. So, you know, we kind of started thinking all right, it's obviously not just a good engineering thing, um, but maybe it's just inappropriate technology. There's this whole thing around appropriate technology. And this UV system is imported. It's not from the community. So maybe that's the problem. And appropriate technology, this term was first started by E.F. Schumacher. He has a book called Small is Beautiful, um, which when I started doing this work, I really liked. And um, it's back from 1973. And he says that appropriate technology is small scale, it's labor intensive, and does not require a lot of capital, uses local materials, and it's controlled by local communities. So maybe that was it. We just didn't do an appropriate, we didn't implement appropriate technology. So the same technology, just as a case study, had also been built at Les Brown's Children's Aid Orphanage in Rwanda, but this time we're in Muganero, so slightly south. And it's the exact same technology, basically. There's your box with the UV system. Only this time, we went back and it worked. And we went back and it was still being used. We went back and it was still being used. And I got an email from Victor, who's the orphanage director, even just a couple years ago and it was still being used. Now orphanages are illegal in Rwanda and that's another story. Um, but the problems seem to be solved more or less. So if success wasn't dependent on the type of technology we used, it was still an inappropriate technology maybe, what was different? So let's look at another case study as an example. The Ministry of Education and UNICEF, they implemented this WASH project in schools in Belize. And I was doing an evaluation for the Ministry of Education. And phase one of their project, they constructed toilets in 36 schools. And for some odd reason, they constructed some flush toilets and some pit latrines. And there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason behind who got what. So they were constructing flush toilets in communities that had pit latrines or nothing. And they were constructing pit latrines in communities that all had flush toilets. Couldn't really figure it out. Um, but that made for a really interesting case study or research to figure out if, you know, was the appropriateness or familiarity of that technology the reason why it succeeded? Did those schools that had flush toilets in a community that had pit latrines or nothing, are those the ones that failed? 
So forgive the madness up here, but um, using a method called qualitative comparative analysis, which I can talk about in Q&A if, okay, Ruth knows what it is. Um, it just compares the two different scenarios, which are outcomes, and then looks at which causal conditions are influential or necessary in this case. So we do an analysis to see which of these conditions are necessary to the outcome of functioning toilets. And what we found was that the familiarity of the technology was the lowest thing in that list. So of all the schools that had functioning toilets, there's kind of these five different pathways that they took to get there. Only two of those five include familiar technology. The only thing that seemed to be necessary, so every single school that had functioning toilets also had local involvement. Didn't matter if they had a flush toilet or a pit latrine or what type the communities had, nothing to do with technology. It was that they were involved and not just they put some pipes together, but they felt like they had decision-making power in the process. That was the only thing that was a necessary condition. So if we look at the counterfactual, what are the pathways to non-functioning toilets? We find that unfamiliar technology is still not really all that relevant. Whereas poor quality construction is necessary. So there was this one contractor who did some pretty shoddy work and all of his toilets seem to fail. That's kind of common sense. All right, so technology type wasn't influential. There were four cases, four schools where there was flush toilets. Um, but there wasn't a single flush toilet in the community. It's all pit latrines or using the bush. And every single one of those toilets actually functioned two to three years later. So not necessarily an issue of the appropriateness of the technology. So the whole thing here is that quality and social factors, their feeling of involvement, um, if the community is contributing to a maintenance budget, these things actually ended up being much bigger problem solvers than the technology itself. So, since 1973, the term appropriate technology has been built on. Um, some would say criticized, uh, but I'll say built on. And I really liked this kind of definition or clarification from 1988 by Ben Tim. And he says that low capital investment, small scale, use of locally available resources, um, kind of these things that we expect from the definition of appropriate technology, they're not always possible and sometimes they can actually contradict each other. And so he really kind of shifted things from a focus on infrastructure, on a water system, on a toilet, into looking at long-term service delivery systems, kind of this bigger systems perspective by saying that it's important to focus on increasing the knowledge base of the country so locals have practical technical skills relevant to their country's needs. That's in his definition of appropriate technology, but it has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with social factors. And kind of this idea of trying to reinforce or build up these local support structures. So kind of building on that, WaterAid did a study in Madagascar where they asked a similar question. Some of these water systems are failing, some of them are not, why is that? And they kind of mapped it out, I've simplified it here, but they mapped it out to all these different sort of links in a chain, if you will, including user motivation, um, maintenance, are there service providers for maintenance, are parts available, is there external support, is there a government program that offers support, um, money, what's the willingness or ability to pay of community members, not just for the infrastructure, but maintaining it, using it, um, all those operational and maintenance costs. And then you'll see that technology is up here as well, including the appropriateness and the quality of construction. And what they found is that if any one link in this chain breaks, the whole service delivery system is very likely to fail. And that does include appropriate technology. So we can talk about that for a little bit because there's some really cool innovations out there. So appropriate technology and innovation are very critical. Here is one example of where technological innovation can be quite helpful. So when latrines, latrine pits fill up, and I have, bam, there we go, it's full. <laughs> How do you empty them? I love graphics. 
All right, one option, you could have a commercial vacuum truck. So this truck actually comes in, puts the hose into the latrine and pumps it out. The problem is a lot of peri-urban areas, you end up with really narrow walkways like this. And there's just not enough space for vacuum trucks. They also tend to be quite expensive. Another option is emptying by hand. Um, pretty self-explanatory, right? <laughs> I don't even have to say why that's a bad option. So um, one innovation, and this is from an engineer named Steve Sugden out of the UK. He has actually done this um, by choice because he just wanted to see what it was like and kind of gets into things with his job. But in doing that, he learned a lot about fecal sludge and um, he created this gulper. And basically you can carry this thing by hand you can carry it down really narrow walkways, into pit latrines. It goes into the pit. It's a hand-powered pump that pulls out fecal sludge, puts it in a barrel, and then they put that barrel on a truck and drive away. Nobody has to get in the pit. You don't need an expensive um, truck to pull stuff out. So it is kind of one of those innovations that while it might not solve all the problems, um, it is an important link in that chain. Another one, um, what do you do with the waste from the pit? Option one, you just dump it somewhere, which is usually what happens. You see it in rivers and um, landfills and two blocks from the house where they emptied the pit. Another option is to take it to a treatment plant. Um, but I work mostly in low-income countries, so this is rarely an option. Sometimes there's a treatment plant um, and it doesn't even work. So waste goes in there and then it comes out exactly how it was when it went in. So that's not always an option either. So one option, and again, like technology is not the only answer, but this is one option depending on the context, is um, composting toilets or ecological sanitation. And I love this truck. To you it may be shit, to us it's money. Shit business is serious business. So ecological sanitation, it's a very ancient technology. It's just the idea of utilizing urine and feces and the nutrients that are contained in those for agricultural purposes. And I've seen this at schools in Uganda where they'll collect urine and feces, they compost it, and they use it on the school garden, and they grow food, and they eat that food at the school, and it's this really beautiful process. I've also seen ecological sanitation that was a complete disaster. Um, so I think it's very context dependent, but very cool idea. Another challenge, um, I did some work in the Peruvian Amazon and these are water systems uh, that are kind of managed by small communities in the rural areas. And a lot of the households did not like the fact that they used chlorine. Um, so one option, and I just added this after Dr. Mar who was at Dr. Marquez's talk? You can raise your hand. Yeah, it was awesome. So Dr. Robert Marquez, um, he gave a talk. He's from ICAST, right before me, over in the Center for Southwest Studies. And I wanted to highlight this for those of you that were at that talk, that you know, here's an example of a technological innovation that is an important link in that chain as well. So if you don't want to use chlorine, um, there's these really creative pots that are ceramic and they actually put sawdust in the mixture and then they fire them and the sawdust burns out and it leaves these little pore spaces and that gets rid of bacteria and then they coat them with colloidal silver and then that kills viruses and so you actually get really high kill rates without the use of chlorine for situations where that's not appropriate. So appropriate technology is critical, but technology in and of itself, it inherently increases dependence. If I have technology, now I need spare parts. Think about your smartphone. Uh, I have this really cool technology, but now I have to charge it. I need power from somewhere. Technology just creates that dependence. It doesn't mean it's bad, but it's something that we need to think about. So we also need some innovative approaches to how we can actually support not just technological innovation, but these local sort of system that helps support service delivery forever. Not just the water system, not just the toilet, not just the infrastructure, but how do we help support this big system um, that can kind of keep things going and avoid undermining them at a minimum. And a lot of times we do that without meaning to, we have the best of intentions. Um, so really keeping this system in mind 
is critical. An example of that might be your well-meaning NGO, which I have been a part of, and you've constructed latrines, and you go back six months later and the latrines aren't working, and so you help them fix it. And you go back a few months later and the latrines, there's something broken with a few households, so you help them fix it. During that time, any service providers that are local, local people that have jobs, that want to go in and repair toilets as their career, they can't compete with you because you just repaired those toilets for free. So you knocked them out of the system. Then you leave after a few years when your grant's finished and there's a big hole there and you've taken away one of those links in that chain that's critical to providing services forever. Um, so just kind of that systems level thinking. So some interesting system supportive innovations and I'm probably getting way too kind of crazy at this point, but I wanted to give some examples of what I meant by innovations that can support the whole system. Um, CU Boulder with USAID funding and a lot of different partners, they're actually mapping out this system in different countries, four countries. And they're looking at who are the actors, who's involved, what government levels are involved, what NGOs are involved, who does what, what are the relationships, to try and understand how we can support these systems better. Um, another example is Water for People has a program called Sanitation as a Business, where instead of constructing toilets, they actually work with local entrepreneurs to get them kind of in the sanitation business. Um, and then they build affordable toilets and it's kind of this more sustainable system level um, solution. So NGOs can leave and the idea is that these entrepreneurs are still there. There are of course households that can't pay anything or can pay very little for sanitation. And so there's been some really interesting public private partnerships where government will team with entrepreneurs. Um, in India, one example, India is a fascinating example. They actually have sort of different income levels and people know what level they're in. And if you're in one of the bottom rungs in this one district, you would get a toilet um, kind of certificate and you could take that into the local entrepreneur businesses that would construct a toilet. And so here you have government coming in and supporting subsidies at the lower level, but it's all going through local businesses and it kind of builds this local support system that's really strong and isn't dependent on us. So success, in my opinion, is that everyone has water and sanitation and aid organizations are no longer needed. So to me, that's like, I need to work myself out of a job. So in order to achieve this, I'm going to suggest, might not be right, but suggest that we need innovation, but not just for technology. We need to design these really system supportive um, approaches and innovative technology is a part of that, but it's not going to solve all of our water and sanitation problems. So that's all I had. Um, some interesting reading if you want to learn more. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it.